Good afternoon. Welcome to this meeting of the UW System Board of Regents. Let's start by calling the roll. Regent President Walsh? Here. Regent Vice President Bogus? Here. Regent Adams? Regent Atwell? Regent Brinkus? Here. Regent Cologne? Here. Regent Jones? Here. Regent Cruiser? Here. Regent Manideets? Here. Regent Miller? Here. Regent Peterson? Here. Regent Prince? Here. Thank you. Regent Rye? Here. Regent Staten? Regent Tyler? Regent Underly? Here. Regent Wax? Here. Regent Weatherly? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Chancellor Gao and his staff for this great opportunity to come to the beautiful University of Wisconsin La Crosse to see your campus and to uh, meet together and work on the issues we all care about. So thank you very much um, to Chancellor and staff. And before we get started, I think President Rothman has a few introductions. I, I do. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome and introduce several new colleagues from across the UW system. First, welcome to Edwin Martini, the new Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at UW Oshkosh. Ed, who started in his new role earlier this week, uh, is a 20-year higher education professional and will be responsible for leading UW Oshkosh's colleges, faculty, instructional staff, and academic programs. He comes to us from Western Michigan University, where he most recently served as Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning. He originally joined WMU as an assistant professor in the history department and went on to serve in a number of roles with progressively increasing leadership responsibility from associate department chair and associate dean to associate provost and vice Pro provost. Ed, Ed earned a bachelor's degree with honors in American studies from Pritzker uh, College in Claremont, California, and a doctorate in American studies from the University of Maryland. His research inter interests include po the political, diplomatic, and cultural aspects of 20th century U.S. history, the American War in Vietnam, and the history of American foreign relations. Uh, welcome, Ed, and I would ask that you please stand so you could be recognized. We very much look forward to working with you, and I know your chancellor is very excited as well. Next, I'm pleased to introduce Monica Smith, Associate Vice President for Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging for the UW System. Monica previously served at Augustana, Augustana College in Rock Island, Illinois. Monica is, is a clinically trained uh, social worker with a broad background from child welfare to higher education. She will work closely with university leaders focused on inclusivity and diversity to develop and share best practices to advance our strategic plan, including in, including increasing access to our universities and creating a sense of belonging for all of our students on campus, including first-generation students, disabled students, veterans, students with different political ideologies, students with differing religious beliefs, as well as those students from underrepresented groups. In addition to being the chief officer for UWSA, Monica will be a resource to our campuses with respect to recruiting, developing and retaining high quality and diverse faculty and staff, as well as championing free expression and civil discourse. Our goal is to ensure we have an inclusive environment for all of our students, helping to prepare the talent needed for Wisconsin employers to compete in a global economy. Monica earned her doctorate and master's degree in social work at the University of Pennsylvania and a bachelor's degree at Eastern College, now Eastern University in Pennsylvania. Welcome aboard, Monica, and would you please stand so that we could recognize you. We are very excited to have you, and we look forward to working with you collaboratively and collectively, because creating that inclusive environment where students feel a sense of belonging cannot be solely the responsibility of our diversity leaders. It has to be the responsibility that all of us bear. So with that, President Walsh, back to you. Thank you, President Rothman. The record of the June 8 and 9 meeting of the UW System Board of Regents has been provided. Are there any corrections? Hearing none, the minutes are approved as distributed. And now I will turn the floor back over to you, President Rothman. 
Oh, wait, no. No, you're going to do a few things first. Oh, okay. sorry. There we go. <laughs> At least I hope you are. I'm in trouble. No, I, I am. I am doing this. Yeah, I'm going to do a brief update on the UW Parkside search process to replace Chancellor Ford. As we reported at the last meeting, the Search and Screen Committee is currently reviewing applications and will reconvene next week to select semifinalist candidates to interview later this summer. So they are moving well. The Search and Screen Committee is led by Regent Chair Kyle Weatherly with Professor Adrian Bidamantes as co-chair and will then recommend a slate of candidates to the special regent committee which will select the finalists to continue on in the process. In addition to visiting the UW Parkside campus in September, the finalists will interview with the special regent committee and that group includes regents Hector Cologne, John Miller, Ashok Rai, and Jennifer Statton, along with Regent Weatherly as chair. It's anticipated that this search process will conclude before this board's next regular meeting in October. I'd like to once again thank the members of the search committee for their hard work this summer and uh, to help us identify the leader to replace Debbie Ford. Another quick update, we are continuing to recognize how UW System Universities are building strong relationships with businesses in support of our students and communities with our Regents Business Partnership Award. Due to this being the July 4th holiday week, however, we are not presenting an award at this time, but will resume next month. Finally, at last month's meeting, President Rothman mentioned the impressive number of first-generation college students who are enrolling and graduating from our universities. It, it really got me thinking um, about the way we define diversity. And because my personal history um, was of a young woman from a small farming community where about a third of the kids in my high school either lived on a farm or had direct ties to a farm, um, it feels it's very daunting to come to a large university. Even our smaller universities seem large to a first generation student. And so I, I feel like I have a small connection to those students who need that kind of outreach that we give to all the diverse parties that we deal with. Um, so I would just like to thank all of those on our campuses who make first generation students, first of all, understand that it's possible to change the, the trajectory of their life through college education or technical college education. Um, some of us took some convincing, only about a third of my high school graduating class went to a four year college. That was back in 1977. Um, I think we can do better numbers than that, even with the declining demographics, but we can't do it without the folks who work with those young people and work with our veterans and work with returning adult students. So that's just my piece on um, making sure that we understand diversity is probably broader than most of us consider. Now I go to you, President Rothman. Fair enough. Thank you for, for sharing. President Walsh, uh, you can sense the, the impact that education has had in your life. Later this afternoon, we will have an update on our overall progress we've made to date regarding the execution of our strategic plan and also take a look ahead. Before that, however, I'd like to offer a brief overview of how we are working consistent with that plan to foster an open and robust sharing of ideas and our efforts to encourage broader civil discourse among our students. Since arriving at the UW system a little over a year ago, I've had the pleasure of speaking with hundreds of students, and I continue to be so very impressed. They're smart, they're enthusiastic, and they're brimming with ideas to make the world better. And I'm just glad I'm not competing against them. One of those ideas is a gathering called It's Just Coffee. To be clear, this was the brainchild of a UW-Madison student. All good ideas are borrowed from somebody else, and this one I borrowed who recognize that amid the political polarization in our country and on our campuses, students of differing backgrounds could discuss difficult topics, whether that be politics or religion or economics, foreign affairs and so forth, in a respectful civil way if they have a low-key, non-threatening environment to do so. I really like this idea so much that I asked the student in Madison if, it, if I could have his permission to replicate those it's just coffee gatherings across the system. He, he concurred and allowed me to do that for which I am grateful. 
And to date, we have had coffee events at four campuses, Oshkosh, Eau Claire, Platteville, and Milwaukee. They've been fairly intimate gatherings with 10 to 12 students and provided the opportunity to talk about issues like why it's important to discuss difficult topics. Following these sessions, we spoke to a number of students who participated, and today we have a brief video to give you a sense of how those conversations went. So with that, if you would roll the video, please. We stray away from these kinds of conversations or we're so stuck in our viewpoints that these conversations don't really happen, and when they do, they just escalate to screaming matches between two people. Being able to break that down and talk about how do we break that down, uh, I think it's important to address overall. Today was really great. It was a really awesome opportunity to get to speak with uh, the president for UW System. Getting to hear how much he cares about students on campus and on our voices was just really impactful. And knowing that we matter to him as much as his role matters to all of us. I think these conversations are vital to me and my peers because they're preparing us for our futures. It's not just about what we're learning in college. It's taking that knowledge and education and then bringing it to our careers after college. Once we get out into the real world, there's not going to be such a safe space to have these conversations. So to be able to share opinions and be able to understand each other better now just prepares us for later in life. I think conversation and discussion is key in, in opening our minds and, and allowing a place to be able to share um, share your beliefs, but also listen to other people's beliefs. And I try and surround myself with people with different perspectives. And I think that just makes us better human beings when we understand people better. Um, and so yeah, I loved hearing about everyone's uh, different viewpoints and how their identity shapes uh, their viewpoints. There were still opinions that I heard new um, and lots of new examples of civil discourse happening even within this conversation. Different perspectives of things that they've, uh, things that everyone's kind of experienced or um, brought to the university already. If there's two aisles, um, you know, just because you believe something in that aisle doesn't mean that you have to believe all of these. And it's okay, like we all have differing opinions and that's something that should be valued and that what makes us unique and that's important. Without hearing both ends of the spectrum, we're not able to um, evolve or move forward without different opinions. If we have the same opinion, nothing's gonna change, nothing's gonna happen. Sometimes people don't feel included in these kind of conversations or like they can't bring up their opinions. And I think that's definitely something that we should think about when we're talking to people and encourage them to express their opinions. Hearing that a lot of students have difficulty and fear expressing those opinions definitely concerns me and it's something that I want to uh, figure out how we can make sure despite of what you believe or where you fall in the political spectrum um, of, you know, that you are accepted and welcome here. I am now more open than ever as it pertains to finding different solutions for folks that are self-censoring and thinking about different ways to combat that at a peer-to-peer -peer level. We need to have more discussions about divisive events because we really all want the same thing a lot of times even if it's not apparent on the surface. And even though there's people on the opposite side of the political spectrum for me, it was really nice to have it reiterated that we do feel the same way. We might not have the same viewpoints, but we both want to be respected. We both want to share each other's opinions and it was it's really encouraging to be right, we might not agree, but we can still have a conversation. A lot of people learned a lot and I thought some great ideas really went around and there is potential for some very great change to put us in a positive direction. I think it felt very hopeful at the end. I think there was a lot of uh, a lot of faith kind of reinstilled in everyone. I'll definitely kind of carry that um, throughout the rest of my time here on campus and understand that everybody has their own upbringing and formulation of opinion. This allows us to learn and understand everyone's point of view as well as just overall become a better human being. for generations. I think we're a little ahead of ourselves on the videos, but that's okay. Um, you, you can see the themes coming out that we have much more in common than we have uh, differences. And I think you know th those students were, were so impressed, impressive to me in having those conversations because they were open and they were candid. Uh, and I look forward to having more of them this fall. Uh, now I'd like to share with you a few legislative and other updates. Uh, first, as I'm sure you've heard, the U.S. Supreme Court has issued its final decision as to the use of race in the admissions de in admission de decisions. Our legal team has been working with our universities for months to prepare for this decision. I hope it goes without saying that we will comply with the law. Our analysis of the implications of, the of this decision will be ongoing. 
However, we have already established resources to address questions and to provide guidance as needed to our universities on this topic. There will be more to come, including proposed revisions of existing region policies, as well as potential modifications to several metrics set forth in our strategic plan and a review of potential additional guidance from rele relevant f federal agencies, which we are expecting in the near term, all of which will help us ensure that we are operating in accordance with the Supreme Court's ruling, uh, as well as meeting our other obligations under federal law. Now I'd like to uh, address the biennial state budget, my first since becoming UW system president. Uh, to be direct, uh, the budget was a disappointment and it sets back our goal of partnering with the state to meet work workforce challenges. At a time when Wisconsin has a historic surplus, much of the legislative debate, unfortunately, was not about the opportunity to make a significant investment in Wisconsin's most prolific talent generator to meet our state's workforce needs, but rather about cutting our budget because of diversity and inclusion staffing. To reiterate, there was never a broad-based conversation about an appropriate increase in our budget. Rather, the discussion focused solely on how large the cut would be. So zero was the best that we could do. On the issue of diversity and inclusion, please let me be clear. The UW system remains committed to diversity and inclusion. And you just heard Regent President Walsh talk about why that is important. We are educating students from a variety of backgrounds to enter an increasingly diverse and globally competitive workforce. I saw firsthand the need for this focus during my decades in the private sector. Our employers are counting on our preparing students for a global marketplace, and our students rightfully expect to be exposed to and learn from a broad spectrum of cultures, ideas, and opinions. And I think you just saw that in the tape from It's Just Coffee. Across the UW system, DE&I staff help to foster student success across a range of fields to ensure veterans can successfully transition to college. And I didn't realize how hard that was, but to go from a very rigid military environment to a very flexible college environment is a tough transition. We're working with those students. Our DE&I staff work to provide services for disabled students, to forge more opportunities for women in STEM fields, and to support first-generation students like our Regent President, in addition to serving groups and students from underrepresented groups. The people in these roles are doing important and they are doing valuable work, not only for the UW system, but for the state of Wisconsin. We need to develop all the talent we can in this state. That is our number one job at our universities. At the same time, and I, as I have acknowledged to the legislature and will continue those conversations, in an organization as large as ours, there may be time when our initiatives may stray from the primary mission of student success. We acknowledge that and we will make every effort to keep our work in that space on track. But let me pivot from the budget battle specifically and into something that affects all Wisconsinites. That is the war for talent. It comes up in every meeting that I have when I venture outside of the universities. It is real and it is urgent. Directly or indirectly, it affects every, every resident of our state. When we fall short of nurses, healthcare access is limited not only in our rural communities, but in all of our communities. When companies cannot find engineers to fill jobs here, they move those jobs where they can be filled. And those jobs will never come back to the state of Wisconsin. When the state does not have enough data scientists to innovate, to inspire, to analyze, all of Wisconsin loses out on family supporting jobs that follow. And I could go on, but I think you probably get the point. The UW system, the state's greatest talent generator and magnet, should be a key asset to leverage in this war for talent. Whether it is creating learning and research capacity with a new engineering building at UW-Madison or investing in student affordability and access. Continuing to shrink our budgets is going to have consequences for our university system without question. But more importantly, more importantly, those consequences will jeopardize the long-term competitiveness of Wisconsin and our economic vibrancy. It is profoundly serious when our universities seek an increase than what, that was substantially less than inflation. 
and instead face cuts that function to have us reduce our purchasing power by hundreds of millions of dollars. At a time when Wisconsin has a historic $7 billion surplus, it is inconceivable to me that we are not using even a portion of that to invest in the state's best talent generator. Our UW system universities produce nearly 37,000 graduates each year, and nearly 40% of them are in high paying STEM and healthcare fields. Wisconsin employers rely on the critical thinking skills, creativity, and collaboration that UW system education fosters, and our funding increase was request was designed to increase the number of graduates and help Wisconsin win the war for talent. I acknowledge and we all know that reducing our expenses is going to be key in, immediate, in an immediate operational undertaking as most of our universities face serious structural deficits. However, another cut on top of a decade of frozen revenues is going to be extraordinarily difficult to affect. In the face of historic surpluses and high inflation, it is difficult for me to fathom at least that that kind of cut of those magnitude, particularly when our university system already ranks 42nd out of 50 states in the country for public support of its mission. In my humble, in my humble opinion, Wisconsin deserves better than that. As we move into a technology-driven knowledge economy, the investments we make or do not make will define Wisconsin's future. The state is rightfully making investments in our correction system and in affordable housing to the effect of hundreds of millions of dollars. But an investment in higher education should have been part of that conversation. That is why this is such a disappointment and a missed opportunity we will not get back. But it is more than just a missed opportunity. Funding at this level threatens our mission of accessibility and affordability. In other words, it means that Wisconsin students lose, and that should be, in my view, unacceptable. With all of that said, and before we move on, I want to remind all of us, particularly in these challenging times, about what we do and why it is so critically important. So I want to share another video. This one was produced before the pandemic, but it continues to ring true. It is our celebration, it is a celebration of our mission, our proud history, and the opportunities we provide for tens of thousands of students every year. Let's roll that video, please. For generations, the University of Wisconsin has stood alongside the people of Wisconsin, listening and learning, advancing knowledge, and striving to make lives better. Today, the University of Wisconsin system touches communities in every corner of the state. Preparing graduates to thrive in a world of dynamic change and boundless opportunity. Taking on the toughest challenges and turning bold ideas into real world solutions. Celebrating human creativity from medical breakthroughs to art that moves the spirit. Creative scholarship, groundbreaking research, entrepreneurial know-how changing countless lives one at a time making a difference in our state the nation and the world expanding the horizons of what's possible drawing on our heritage and building for the future it's all in wisconsin the university of wisconsin system Here at the UW system, we will rally in the face of challenges posed by shrinking budgets. That's the Wisconsin way. There will be tough choices ahead, but we will remain student focused and we will keep Wisconsin's well being front and center. But no, they make no mistake, our ability to provide these opportunities is connected to the state's willingness to invest. I know full well from my prior life that you cannot cut your way to success. You need to invest in order to prosper. I also know how to read an income statement and review a balance sheet. We have a lot of work to do, but our efforts to champion our universities will only intensify. The life-changing impact our universities can have for every Wisconsinite is simply too important 
to not double down on our efforts to be there for them. And as I conclude, it is only appropriate that we celebrate some great accomplishments. Unless it gets lost in all the recent swirl, there are great accomplishments. UW-Eau Claire was honored last week as Chancellor Jim Schmidt accepted the third place award for Engaged University of the Year by the Accreditation Council for Entrepreneurial and Engaged Universities. Eau Claire was the only finalist from North America for this international award, which honors universities that inspire innovation, collaboration, and positive change in their communities. Our congratulations to Chancellor Schmidt and the entire UW, UW Eau Claire campus. Congratulations. And one of our key priorities in the strategic plan is to sell, send more UW graduates out into the workplace, particularly in areas of high need. One of those key areas is educators. The Department of Public Instruction recently announced its five winners of Teacher of the Year honors, and I am very proud to say that all five of the award recipients completed some aspect of their licensure program at a UW institution. Between undergraduate and master's degrees, this year's winners came through <coughs> UW Eau Claire, UW La Crosse, UW Milwaukee, UW Oshkosh, and UW River Falls. One of these five individual honorees will now be selected by a committee to rep represent Wisconsin in the National Teacher of the Year program later this year. The point is this, the UW system is helping build the foundation for the next generation because we all know how important teachers are because I'm sure all of you can remember that one teacher that made a real difference in your life and why you're sitting here today. The UW system awarded over 3,500 education degrees in 2021 and 22. That was the highest number since 2008 and 09. Add in certificates, some of which allow the recipient to become a fully certified teacher, and the number is closer to 3,700. This includes around 2,000 undergraduate degrees, most of which lead directly into teaching and that was the best result since 2014 and 15. I would also note that UW institutions produced 76% 70 of all of the graduates who filled jobs as elementary, middle, secondary, and special education teaching positions in the state, 76%. Again, this is something that we can and should be very proud of. And with that, I conclude my report and we'll be back to you, President Walsh. Thank you, President Rothman. Now I'll turn the floor over to our host, Chancellor Joe Gao. Thank you, President Walsh. It's such a pleasure to have the Regents back on our campus. And as I look around the room, I see many wonderful UWL faculty, staff, and students, and I know they would all agree that we're really excited about having you here, having the system leadership, having our colleagues from the other campuses. It's really a special uh, moment, as all my chancellor uh, colleagues will acknowledge. We only do this every few years. It's been five years since the regents last met here, and then five years prior to that, and five years prior to that. That's how old I am. Um, but when we set this up, uh, Jess Lathrop was in her old role, the previous role, and you said, would you like to have a meeting this time in July? All those other meetings were in January, and it's a little cold here in January, and you don't really want to be outside. <laughs> but I said, great, July, but then you start thinking, that could be pretty hot, too. Might not be very comfortable. Well, I am delighted. This weather is going to be awesome today and tomorrow, and uh, we'll have our reception outside uh, tonight at 5, and I hope that you get some time to just walk around um, not only our campus, but La Crosse, and I know many of you are staying um, by the river, and I don't think any trip to this area would be complete without the mighty Mississippi and seeing that. And I think um, one of my colleagues even brought his bicycle, uh, I heard. Yeah, so that's a smart chancellor there. So um, again, great to see everybody on the campus, and I have the distinct privilege 
of talking about some wonderful things that have been happening um, here at UWL. Um, you know, our enrollment is really strong. Our workforce development remains strong. Our campus and community partnerships are thriving. And tonight at the reception, there will be many, many um, business and community leaders there. So I encourage you to um, mingle and, and talk to them. They're very eager uh, to meet the regents and people from UW system. So let's begin. It's an exciting time to be here. And before I dig deeper, I want to highlight a few recent developments of which we're especially proud. You'll see UWL is the number one public university in Wisconsin with fewer than 25,000 students, according to US News and World Report's ranking of the best national universities for 2022-23. Before we were promoted to this national category, we were the top ranked comprehensive campus in UW system for 21 consecutive years. That is extraordinary, and it's because of those people that I mentioned uh, at the outset here, their passion for providing an outstanding experience to our students. Last fall, we welcomed another record-setting first-year class, 2,308 students. Overall enrollment also held steady, defying state and national trends. I feel like I say this every year, but Corey Showquist, and he's our Assistant Vice Chancellor for Admissions and Recruitment, and our team are second to none, and they work with tireless enthusiasm to ensure students and families have the information they need to make sure the right decision is made. Now, it's still early, and we never want to get ahead of ourselves, but it looks like we'll be welcoming another strong class come September, and I just saw Corey, where are you, Corey? There you are over there. And I always ask, how are we doing today? And last year, it was 2308. This year, 2309. So we're on pace to do another record class. So thank you for the great work that you and your team do. I asked him if any of the, the mission staff were going to be here. He said, no, they're working. Their family's here today. Their family's here tomorrow. Um, so it's great the, the work that you do to keep things so strong here uh, on our campus. Last winter, we opened our new field house to the campus community, and every aspect of the building is state of the art from the NCAA comp com competition track to locker rooms and meeting spaces outfitted with the latest technology. The field house supports a variety of activities and user groups including track and field competitions, student recreation, and exercise and sports science research. If you haven't had a chance to see it, I highly encourage you to take a look. It's over um, in that direction, uh, not a, a very long walk. And speaking of the field house, I would be remiss if I did not take a moment to recognize our track and field teams. This year, the women's team won the indoor and outdoor national championships for Division Three, and the men's team won the indoor national championship and placed second outdoor. And you know, that's never ever happened in NCAA history that one school had both the men's and women's teams win the national championship in the same year. So that's pretty special. Um, I invited the coaches to come and I don't know whether they were able to make it. I think they're out recruiting just like our missions, <laughs> missions folks are doing their job. Um, but I, wow, that is very impressive. And that meant that they had the opportunity to celebrate at the White House with Vice President Kamala Harris. And what a wonderful testament to their skill, dedication, and ability to work as a team. Their success is so well-deserved. So please join me in acknowledging our outstanding men's and women's track and field team. I think as you'll see, that's our seal in the front, and you'll see it's mind and body, men's corpuscu. So from the very beginning, 1909, this has always been about those two uh, elements of being human, and I think we do it real well here at UWL. When you're fortunate enough to lead a university like ours, people sometimes ask, what is the key to the success? And it's not hard for me to come up with the answer. The key to everything we do is our people, as I've said. As a chancellor, as any leader, you can have the best intentions and the brightest ideas, but none of that matters unless you have the right people in the right positions to help all of us succeed. It starts with them. Without our people, nothing we do would be possible. 
A good example is our community engagement initiative. We launched it several years ago with the goal of strengthening our relationships with the community and encouraging everyone to make a positive difference however they can. This initiative comprises all the ways we touch the community, internships, research, service learning, volunteerism, and more. And while this is ongoing work that can never truly be finished, I'm pleased to say we are already seeing great success. Last year, the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, ASK you, recognized our new Community Engaged Learning Program with its Excellence and Innovation Award for Civic Learning and Community Engagement. This is an incredible accomplishment, and it is a credit to Lisa Klein, our Community Engagement Coordinator, and all the people who have supported her work. Lisa, are you here today? If you Can you stand up? There she is, Community Engagement Coordinator, leading the way. We won that award, I think, like a year after you started with us. Two years, OK. And then I get to go to California, and they give me the trophy. But it's your the trophy there. Thank you for all that you do. As we've engaged with the community, we've been fortunate to connect with so many fantastic businesses and organizations. Just like our university would not be the same without our people, our community would not be the same without partnerships. All across the region, we have found eager partners who share our vision for building a better lacrosse and a stronger Wisconsin. Here's one we think you will recognize. Business partners help fuel UW lacrosse, and one of those longtime partners helps fuel Wisconsin and the upper Midwest. Lacrosse-based Quick Trip owns and operates 491 stores in Wisconsin and a total of 839 stores when you add in Minnesota, Iowa, Illinois, and Michigan. It's a true economic driver. More than 37,000 workers serve 11.5 million guests each week. What fuels Quick Trip? Terrific people. Vice President Steve Lair says, UWL plays an uh, invaluable part in, in our recruiting quality, uh, quality workforce for Western Wisconsin. And STEM graduates are a key ingredient for success. Science graduates are incredibly important for us. QuickChip is one of the few companies in the United States that has its own food safety lab. And it's crucial for us to uh, ensure that our food is safe before it gets shipped from our distribution center. So the food safety lab is incredibly important to us. QuickTrip is the most vertically integrated convenience store company in the country with its own dairy, bakery, and kitchens in La Crosse. That's why QuickTrip has its own award-winning food safety lab led by UWL science graduate Kevin Miller. Miller received his bachelor's in biology and microbiology and his master's in microbiology from UWL. Miller does the hiring for his lab and praises the graduates of his alma mater. The candidates we get from UWL, they have a very strong science base, and that base is very critical because when we get them in the lab, when they get hired, we just build on that base. The lab is crucial to the success of Quick Trip's food safety program. Lair is proud of Quick Trip's partnership with UWL, including the integrated core program developed with the College of Business Administration. We provide, I think, 20 scholarships a year for UWL students, numerous internships, uh, the ability to come and shadow our co-workers on the job to really see what's behind the door at QuickTrip. We're much more than just a retail convenience company. We're a manufacturer, we're a distributor, we have several hundred people in our IT department, etc. So programs like this ensure us that we get exposed to the best at UWL. outstanding partnership that is and if anyone from quick trip is joining us today thank you for your continued support i don't know whether we had a representative or no it's challenging this week as you know it's the holiday people are that, that's why we, we had hoped to give quick trip the business award right now but their folks are are on the road so um at UWL, we recognize and embrace the important role we play in workforce development. And we know that industry standards are constantly changing. So it's crucial for us to remain nimble and responsive in how we prepare students for future careers. One way we do this, of course, is through the award-winning Community Engaged Learning Program I mentioned earlier. 
This program matches local organizations with UWL students and faculty who are uniquely qualified to keep those organizations over, help those organizations overcome challenges. An accounting class might help a local steel manufacturer review data and make strategic decisions. A recreational therapy class might partner with AARP on a walking program, allowing students to gain hands-on experience with older adults. Through community-engaged learning, students apply skills they've learned in the classroom to real-life projects with real-life impacts. The partner organizations benefit too, receiving quality service or research and connecting with students who may one day come work for them. I'm excited to show you this program in action. We were in an HR uh, development class in which we had a semester long project working with local nonprofits that are part of Great Rivers United Way. And we really focused on HR challenges that they face and uh, help them figure out ways that they could do something better in the human resource field. The students, both in a class embedded project and then a team of students working outside the class, developed a toolbox of human resource management that can help support the great work that our nonprofits do in our communities. What we decided on is something that they are exactly experiencing right now. Managing employee burnout, recruiting employees strategically, as well as recruiting for culture. They created this amazing virtual training that's available for nonprofits in our area, that's freely available to other community members. They're bringing in fresh ideas. They're giving us a different perspective. We bring those students in as if they are one of our own employees. They're attending meetings, they're coming in, they're providing information, they're providing feedback, they're voicing their opinions. So it's mutually beneficial for both of us. I've learned a lot more about creating professional reports, um, definitely communication via email and phone call and meetings. Those are some of the best skills that you can have when you graduate. That short-term gain, I think, is, is real and important. And then again, planting the seeds of community-engaged living, not just community-engaged learning, but so that we have graduates who are then, oh, say, you know, I, I learned a lot about what Big Brothers Big Sisters do. I learned a lot about Wafer and the importance of, you know, food scarcity in communities and, and them coming back to that after graduation and maybe, you know, being part of a board or, or at least, you know, donating their time or, or something of that nature. You have y'all just a little bubble and you have to really branch out and get out of that little bubble to really see what lacrosse all entails and what our community is doing for other members of the community. So it's cool that in a way I'm helping somebody that's helping someone else. I strongly encourage anybody if they are looking at partnering with UWL to do any type of student engagement projects or anything like that, jump off the diving board and do it because it's going to benefit not only your community and your students, but it's going to still benefit your organization. When you talk about workforce development and meeting the needs of employers, it's programs like this that are leading the way. Now, I'm sure I don't need to remind you that we all just experienced a global pandemic. The past few years have shown us the value of close collaboration with local healthcare providers, as well as the importance of providing top-notch healthcare right here on campus. UWL is proud to partner with our two outstanding local providers, Mayo Clinic Health System and Gunderson Health System. And you know, when you ask people what is lacrosse known for, healthcare and education, that, that's the, the answer every time. And we are very fortunate to have those two great partners in this community. Today, I'm gonna to focus on the great work we're doing with Mayo. We partner with Mayo in two important ways. First, we have an agreement that allows students and faculty from UWL and working professionals from Mayo to work together on key research projects. This has created even more hands-on learning opportunities for students. It has strengthened our relationship with one of the world's leading health systems, and it has laid the foundation for breakthroughs in medical research and healthcare education. It is truly a win-win-win. Second, and this is, I think, even more um, unique, we are excited to be partnering with Mayo to run our student health center here on campus. Last year, we reached an agreement that places Mayo in charge of the day-to-day -day operations at the center. This means UWL students can take a short walk and receive world-class health care delivered by skilled and compassionate medical professionals. As you can imagine, this gives parents considerable peace of mind as well. And I will tell you, as somebody that's in my role, 
how wonderful it is to say to parents, you know, if your student has its health challenge, Mayo Clinic is here for them. And everybody knows the quality of what Mayo does. So here's a look at that unique partnership. Mayo Clinic Health System and the University of Wisconsin La Crosse are longtime partners in research and developing tomorrow's healthcare workforce. I'm just astonished at what a great university UWL is. The healthcare system has been able to reap the benefits of UWL's STEM graduates. So our staff is populated here in Wisconsin by many UWL grads. So we are strong advocates and supporters of the University of Wisconsin La Crosse for that reason. It's really the workforce of the future. The organizations have two key relationships. One, Mayo provides physician and provider leadership and services at the Student Health Center on campus. The other is their research partnership. This research relationship is co-led by a UWL leader as well as a Mayo Clinic leader. And because of that relationship, that research partnership, it's resulted in many students participating in research, collaborating not only with their UWL mentors, but also Mayo Clinic physicians and scientists. Which is part of what makes UWL graduates well-trained to provide top quality healthcare. When I moved to the region, I really was struck by the quality of education, all of the STEM fields that are available here, whether it's physics to health sciences and others, it is a great university if you're thinking about a career in science. We are just so fortunate to have an organization like Mayo in our community. And we are honored to have some of the leadership from Mayo who came uh, to be with us here today. We have Regional Vice President Paul Mueller and Paul Malling, who's the head of primary care, and our regional and the regional chair of administration, Tanner Holst. And Tanner and Paul Malling are alums of our great university. So thank you for representing us so very, very well. And Paul Mueller, what can I say? He's the leader. Um, he is a busy man. There's a big new hospital going up on, on their grounds. And we had some last minute schedule changes this morning. And I called Paul and said, hey, we're going to do it at 1 o'clock. And he said, I'll be there. So thank you so much, all of you, for being such great partners. And Paul and his colleagues, of course, they're, they're going to be at the reception. So I know you're very eager to meet people, yes, and talk more about what we're doing. <clears throat> When you're proud of your people and proud of your programs, you want as many students to benefit from them as possible. And you never want a student's circumstances, whether it's a health issue or a disability, to get in the way of their education. Our Access Center is rooted in that belief. When a student has a documented disability, the center works with the student's instructors to ensure equal access to our programs. Accommodations might include extra time or an alternate for format for test taking. It might be a flexible attendance policy. It might be access to classroom recordings. Whatever obstacles stand in a student's way, the Access Center is eager to work with them to find a solution. Andrew Ives, the director, and his team do remarkable work advocating on behalf of our students. And I should say that we're gonna see a video here, and it's a direct result of Regent Rye visited, that was a few months ago. Yeah, it was cold. <laughs> and we took you to the Access Center and he was very, very impressed with what he saw. And he said, you need to tell this story um, more broadly. So um, I did what I'm here to do. I came back to campus and got Jeff Kirkman, and I don't know where Jeff is, our video producer and said, hey, this would be a great uh, thing. And so now we'll see the wonderful results uh, of that. There you are, yeah, okay. I would have ended up dropping classes and I would have gave up. So I was isolating myself. I was spending any time with my friends. I was avoiding going home because I didn't want to tell my parents how I was doing. We're just here for the students and to help them in any way we can. And even if we're not the right place, we'll always make sure that they get the help that they need. The staff, they're not just going to help you with, you know, your academic accommodations. They're going to help you with 
life things. And so they advocate. And that to me is going above and beyond when somebody is willing to be in your corner and advocate for you. The Access Center is here for all students that might run into any sort of barriers. And so our goal is to provide services for students and accommodations for students with disabilities so that they can be successful here at UWL. The majority of the students that I work with have what we call invisible disabilities. So I work with students who have been diagnosed with anxiety, depression, ADHD. There's a lot of self-doubt and self-loathing that happens when there's just something that you can't get or you're too exhausted to keep trying or to keep fighting. It's really important for us to meet individually with students and try to determine their individual accommodation needs. And then we create a plan together and then I train them on how to use each one of those accommodations. I think I used to be really nervous to go to the Access Center and I think I was nervous about the stigma around the Access Center, but when I get my A's on my exams and I get through a really hard exam and I use all of the time that I've been allotted, I'm like, yes, I needed that. We also see a lot of non-traditional students who aren't what, you know, our typical 18 to 24 year olds. So we have non-traditional students, disabled veterans, and are oftentimes looking for what support we have to offer them. I am hearing impaired. I wear hearing aids in both ears and I have anxiety. I know how to do math. I'm going, <laughs> my major is accounting and I'm minoring in math. I'm good at math. So how can I almost fail the class? It was either drop the class or get some help because I was not gonna let myself fail. And the Access Center gives me the ability to take the exams and the quizzes in a quiet, serene environment where I'm not as stressed, I'm not as rushed, and I don't dread it. Oh, that's really my favorite part of the job. Seeing those students come in and just, you know, watching them go through these little victories as they come in and just knowing that you had a little bit of a part in that. I am more confident overall. Just in general, I'm in a better mood. So it's helped my attitude, my confidence, I'm not the same person I was six months ago. I know I can do it. I think earlier I saw Andrew, you're here, and your colleagues, would you please stand and we'll express our gratitude. <laughs> They're doing great work. Personalized services are one way we expand access to UWL education, but it's also critical for students to see themselves reflected and represented in the values of their university regardless of who they are or where they come from. Last fall, I had the unique privilege of joining our campus community at a building dedication ceremony for our Center for the Arts. We named the building for Truman Lowe, a UWL alum who went on to become a world-renowned artist and a beloved professor at UW-Madison. Truman was best known for his sculptures. They often explored the natural environment and his Ho-Chunk heritage, and they were displayed by major galleries around the world. Truman was a master of his craft, and he loved sharing that craft with anyone who would listen. He passed away in 2019, but his legacy endures through his art and the countless lives he's touched. Now, when students walk into our Center for the Arts, they see Truman's name in big letters above the door. We hope it encourages them to learn more about Truman and everything he stood for. And we hope it inspires them to pursue their own dreams wherever they lead, because that's what Truman did. I have an interest in trying to protect as much of the environment as possible. One can choose to be political about it, 
but I want to create enough interest in water through my work that others will begin to share the same beauty and the same understanding that I have of moving water. It's really about that. <laughs> You know, buildings are often named after big money donors, right? La Crosse is taking a very different tack. If a Ho-Chunk student sees Truman T. Lowe's name on the Fine Arts Center at La Crosse, and that's a pretty powerful representation right there. Truman donated, I'm sure, as an alum, but he never gave tons of money. The family didn't give tons of money to the school. It sort of speaks to Truman's legacy. He really influenced thousands of students in general, but he had a very strong impact on Native graduate students as well. He grew up outside of Black River Falls on what's called the Indian Mission. It's a Ho-Chunk community where he was surrounded by extended family and a really close-knit community. Ho-Chunk was his first language, which was not unusual in that community. He grew up with a real understanding of Ho-Chunk culture and heritage. He really kind of entered into being an artist through his experiences at UW-La Crosse, or Wisconsin State as it was called then. He had a lot of great professors there, very involved in their artistic careers. That's where I think he realized that he could become an artist as well. His favorite medium was wood. His father was an excellent basket maker, so he prepared the wood for the baskets that Truman's mother made. He had this deep, deep knowledge of the properties of wood, which I think Truman sort of took on himself as a sculptor. He understood those symbiotic relationships of static versus moving. As he often said, wood is liquid, ultimately. I want to create enough interest in water through my work that others will begin to share the same beauty and the same understanding that I have of moving water. He was a bit of a romantic, some say, but there's also a real reverence for his native heritage that is very evident. He would consider himself a minimalist, reducing forms down to their bare essentials. Truman epitomized that in his work. Even though he was working in this fine art tradition, this avant-garde modernist tradition as an artist, he incorporated the traditional arts and crafts of the Ho-Chunk in particular. He was one of the foremost Native American artists of the late 20th century. He really appreciated the opportunity to learn more about himself and the world through higher education. And he wanted others to have that same kind of experience. And so he became a real advocate for Native students getting into higher education. His life goal was really to promote Native art, to bring Native art out of the past and into the present and have people think about it as a living, breathing, evolving, thing and everything he did were in service of that bigger goal. He was very much sort of the champion on the UW-Madison campus for all things Native American. The coordinator of the Native American Studies program from 1975 to 1988 and that was really an early period for the Native American Studies program. It had only been started a few years before that. He mentored and helped countless individuals, and I consider myself one of those. The dedication of this building is incredibly amazing for our family, for his legacy, all the work that he put into 
promoting Native art and encouraging Native students to go to school. It was the Chancellor's idea, his brainchild. <laughs> he had recently seen an exhibit of Truman's art. This was shortly after Truman passed away. And he thought that would be a wonderful way to celebrate UW Lacrosse alumni. And we know that representation matters. And being a Native student coming onto campus and knowing that there's a building named after a Ho-Chunk artist is the university's way of saying, we see you and we believe in you. Lacrosse meant so much to him. He would have a big grin on his face. <laughs> it couldn't be more beautiful. You never know where the water is going to travel next as it begins to overflow its banks or begins to move its channel. You never really know what's going to happen. So maybe that's a part of it. Yeah, that's the best way to describe it, really. What an excellent tribute to a remarkable man. And I will say personally, I had the privilege of accompanying Truman's family and his biographer, Joe, into the building where we have an exhibit about him and just to see the reaction they had. It's a special thing. Yeah. Um, Want to give special thanks, of course, to Truman's wife, Nancy, his daughter, Tanya, and his close friend and professor emerita from Beloit College, Joe Ortel. We invited them, but they weren't able to be here today because they are traveling, but they've been absolutely wonderful to work with. And I believe Ryan Crane and Casey Brown from the Ho-Chunk Nation are in attendance today. I saw Ryan. There you are. Do you want to stand up? Thanks for coming. And Ryan spoke at the dedication. And Ryan is involved with educational efforts for the Ho-Chunk uh, Nation. And also, if you really have a good memory, you remember when we were here five years ago, he was just graduating from UWL and we told your story there. So this is really uh, very nice, you know, coming full circle. And I also need to acknowledge the um, Board of Regents. Many of you were there when we brought you this idea and you approved it. And you need to know you make all kinds of decisions and many of them have a dramatic impact as we see here. So thank you um, for having the foresight to do that. Um, I'd like to close today by sharing the story of another incredible person, one that, that many of us knew quite well. For many years, Tom Volk taught in our biology department. I guess I should do a trigger warning I may get emotional, I'm sorry about that, but uh, he specialized in mycology, the study of fungi, and became one of the world's foremost experts on the subject. Tom was the quintessential educator. He treasured every opportunity to share his knowledge with students, with non-scientists, with mushroom enthusiasts worldwide. Tom had a knack for making even the most difficult concepts seem simple, fun, and engaging. It's why he was such an effective instructor, and it's why so many people from all over the globe came to him to learn about mushrooms. A list of Tom's awards and research contributions could fill the rest of my time today. But what mattered more to Tom was the people, the relationships that grew from his love of mycology. Tom made time for everyone, and he taught us all a great deal about life. Amid frequent health challenges, Tom was a force of unwavering strength and positivity. In everything he did, he was unapologetically himself, passionate, vulnerable, authentic, and with a zest for life that was all his own. I've not met another person who embodies the human spirit quite like him. And we're going to look at a video that we made 10 years ago. And at that point, we showed the video, and I could acknowledge Tom in the room. I can't do that uh, today. So I hope you find it impactful. Hi, my name is Tom Volk, and I'm a professor at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. Uh, I'm a mycologist, which means I study mushrooms and other fungi. And little did I know when I started this field that fungi would one day help to save my life. People may look at me and not understand my unusual uh, style choices, 
but I have lived through a lot of things. A certain segment of the students that can relate to this, um, it, the students also learn that they should not judge a person by what they look like, by, by what they do and what they have to offer you. The most successful days are when the light bulb goes on for a student, uh, when there's a difficult concept that they might not be able to get, and I'm able to help them to understand that concept. Light bulb goes on above their head, metaphorically, and they get it, and that's pretty cool. I've gone through a lot to get to where I am today, uh, health-wise. I was pretty healthy until 1997 when I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease, which is cancer of the lymph nodes. I had radiation for that, and that's gone, fortunately. In 2002, I started to develop heart problems because of the radiation to my heart. Uh, they try to shield the heart, but it doesn't work so well. And I developed uh, enlarged heart. Uh, and eventually developed arrhythmias in my heart. So I had a defibrillator and pacemaker put in uh, that shocked me a lot of times, uh, eventually. Uh, in 2005, uh, during that period when I was the most sick with my heart, I had flesh-eating bacteria in my foot, and I was in the hospital for about a month for that. Uh, that, was, that was very close to being dead. I became the most interesting case in the ICU at the Mayo Clinic, which is not good. Um, and after that, uh, they decided that my heart was getting worse and worse. It was shocking more and more. And eventually we decided I should have a heart transplant. And in uh, May 22nd of 2006, I received the phone call from the Mayo Clinic uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, I'll never forget the phone call. Uh, the woman on the other end said, hello, this is so-and-so from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, we have a heart for you. So at that time, I became terrified. Um, I didn't expect it that soon, and I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, so my students uh, came and picked me up and took me to the Mayo Clinic. I had to be there very soon and 6.30 in the morning, and it was done by 9.30. Uh, they kept me in an induced coma for a day after that, and then woke me up and wanted me to walk. And I did. So when I, I woke up from my transplant, I knew that I had someone else's heart in me, uh, and that person had died uh, in some sort of accident, I actually don't know. Uh, and I eventually found out that the woman in the room next to me had received the same person's lungs. So I'm assuming that many of the organs, other organs of this person went to help other people in their lives as well. So I'm very grateful to that person. I don't know who they are. And I'm very grateful to their family who had to ultimately make the decision to donate this person's organs to many people and help them in their lives. So when I went to the Gift of Life transplant house after my transplant, uh, a couple weeks afterward, I went home with a lot of drugs, a lot of medicines uh, that would help me in dealing with the transplant. So one of the most important ones that I had was cyclosporin. And cyclosporin is a drug that comes from a fungus called Tulipocladium inflatum. And it is the um, drug that helps to suppress the immune system. Uh, the fungus itself grows on an underground grub, uh, which is very strange, and somehow someone discovered that this fungus would suppress the immune system. So this has allowed my new heart to function very well in my body without being rejected by my immune system. A couple months after my, I had my heart transplant, I learned from one of the other people in the transplant house that he had seen his heart, his old heart that had been taken out. So of course, I, being a biologist, I had to do this and I had to see it. And so I asked to see my heart and I got to see my heart. There are pictures of me holding it. And about a year later, I asked for it again and they said, oh, sure. And so I have my heart, I have my old heart. I keep it on my desk 
in my office. Um, some friends of mine made me a heart cozy for it uh, and uh, because they didn't want to just sit naked on my desk. So this heart cozy is made out of wool that's dyed with mushrooms. So it's very colorful uh, and it has mushroom theme to the whole thing. So it's various kinds of felting and knitting and all sorts of other things like that. It's very cool. Uh, the first time I held my heart in my hand, I cried because it was a very moving experience. Um, I thought about the person whose heart I had in my body and I thought about my heart being held in my hand uh, and it was pretty surreal. Uh, when I give talks to the anatomy and physiology classes, I pull my heart out near the end of the talk and I can hear the gasps from the audience. Uh, and it really brings it home that I really did have a transplant and this is my heart. Students come up afterward and they hold it in their hands and they're, um, it's a very surreal experience for them as well that you know this is someone's heart and it was once in my body. The question people ask is how have I changed from this? And I think that I've become a much more relaxed person. Uh, I am less inclined to worry about what other people think. And I don't sweat the small stuff. The small stuff is not that important. Uh, and I treat every day as the old cliche is true. I treat every day as if it's a gift and it really is. So I often find people who have a health problem or the, um, a psychological problem or they're depressed. And I tell them my story and what will often happen is that they see that I have made it through something that was really terrible and I've turned it into something positive. So I hope that students and other people who see my story can realize that you can make it through this. You know, with the help of your friends and your family, you can do it. Tom passed away in, in the fall. And I will always remember going to uh, the ceremony that was held and just how many lives he touched in a so positive way. He was all in. He taught right to the end. What an inspiring story. Um, and you can't replace someone like that. And I want to finish with a short message written by Mike Abler, who worked with Tom for many years in our biology department. Mike says, we could all learn from Tom's example, be more compassionate, more tolerant as he was, be a better scientist or teacher or friend to someone, do it today. That is the best way to keep Tom in your heart. You don't know how many tomorrows you will have. And those are very poignant words. Well, thank you so much for joining us here today. I hope you enjoy the rest of your time. And as I said, we're gonna have a nice reception uh, at five o'clock uh, in the wonderful weather. And we have a lot of great friends and community people here um, that will be eager to meet everybody. And I guess I will leave, I, I don't wanna leave in too heavy a mode, so a mood. So I'll say, we hope you have a great experience. And if you wanna give us feedback on it, we always enjoy hearing, how'd we do? And I remember when I was teaching, I would just so eager to get those student evaluations. Now, this is a little while ago, and um, they don't give you the evaluations as the provost would know in particular, till after the grades are turned in. <laughs> because we wouldn't wanna put the instructor in a bad mood when they do that grade. So one year I had this new course that I was teaching. So I was particularly interested in how how'd this go over and i did the grading and then i went down to the office and they gave me and this is the days of the paper evaluations um and i read through there <clears throat> and there was one i will never forget it said if i have only one day to live i want to spend it in dr gao's classes but it went on because that day would seem like an eternity. <laughs> Thank you.
I contend. Okay. I didn't see that. In the middle. Welcome back, everyone. Last <laughs> December, you might recall that the board approved a five-year strategic plan for the University of Wisconsin system. I will now turn the floor over to President Rothman for an update on the progress made during the first six months of the plan and preview the work that's still ahead. President Rothman. Okay, thank you very much. And if there's the the plan itself is up here, our, our, our uh, discussion today. Uh, the strategic plan adopted by this board is our North Star at the system and guides our direction moving forward. It is premised on the fact that the status quo is not sustainable. The strategic plan is focused on addressing some of the significant challenges facing our state, including among others, a significant shortage of workers with a four-year degree or more, shifting demographics in the state, a declining perception of the value of a college degree, coupled with a decline in the participation rate of high school students going or high school graduates going on to a four year degree, and the need to maintain and enhance world class research capabilities. In the aggregate, if unaddressed, I believe these issues pose a significant, if not an existential threat to our state's long term economic viability. I am proud of the hard work our team has done to execute on the system-wide strategic plan in the six plus months since its adoption by this board. As you listen to the presentation today, I encourage you to consider the following. First, at this early stage, we will not in this presentation address our performance relative to the plan's uh, stated metrics. We plan to report to the board on a periodic basis on, uh, on our progress against the plan and we will, of course, discuss our performance metrics and our performance relative to those metrics once we are a bit further down the line. Second, there's a significant overlap among our various strategic objectives in the plan, as you will hear shortly, and as you have seen as we've considered the plan. This was intentional, and it helps drive teamwork among our various departments, which collaboration, I am pleased to say, is alive and well. Third, there is a substantial alignment between the system-wide strategic plan and the strategic plans at our universities. I and mean, we ask the chancellors to reflect that connection and it is significant. If you attended the education committee meeting earlier today, you heard about those alignments from the provost at Eau Claire, Platteville, River Falls, and Whitewater. This alignment is essential because fulfillment of the system-wide strategic plan is absolutely dependent. It is absolutely dependent on the efforts of our universities, which is as it should be. Finally, I am proud of the work of, of the entire team to date, including at system administration and in our campuses relative to the execution of the plan. This work is done in addition to their day-to-day -day responsibilities. So I wanted to thank all of them for their efforts uh, in, in working to get move us forward. I'm now pleased to turn the presentation over to Johannes Britz, Senior Vice President for Academic and Student Affairs, Sean Nelson, Vice President for Finance and Administration, and Jeff Brandt, Vice President for University Relationship, Relations. Johannes, Sean, and Jeff will each summarize the various actions their respective teams have taken in furtherance of the system-wide strategic plan, as well as what to expect moving forward. So to start, I'll turn it over to Johannes. Johannes. Thank you very much, uh, President Rothman. Thank you very much, colleagues and, and region members for the opportunity to, to present to you a brief update on where we are in uh, academic and, and student affairs with the strategic plan. As you would see on the slides that we have made available to you ahead of time, we just listed as the start the different strategies. Uh, there are nine of them. From academic affairs, I would like to just stop at this slide and make four comments. Uh, in the Office of Academic and Student Affairs, which is OASA there. Um, we play a key role, as it should be, academic and student affairs, in about every single one of these strategies. So that's why we actually list like 21 different initiatives that we are engaged in or that we will be engaged in as it relates to the strategic plan. Secondly, we did not, uh, and you will see from Sean that he has more a strategic approach per strategy, 
we followed a thematic approach. For example, if you look at online growth, the fourth initiative there, the online growth impacts actually strategy one, two, six, or seven, eight, and nine. So we did it for to really understand and link our thematic approach to the different strategies as it is written down in the strategic plan. The third comment I want to make, and if you even look at the next slide, um, there you can see even more initiatives that we are taking. It, as I mentioned, 21. Two comments here. First of all, we the first year we spent on trying to understand and grasp the landscape of what we have to do so that we can really plot out these are our priorities for the next five years. So we didn't do 21 things at one with no priority. We laid the, understand the landscape, laid it out. And then I would say in the last year, even though we started to really get together on a number of these initiatives, I listed like six of these items that I thought we really did really good progress on was direct admissions, dual enrollments, international, uh, the online growth, and then of course, mental health as well. But on the other areas, it didn't mean we did nothing. We already get people together to get a good understanding of what we need to do as we move forward. Today, I would just briefly, and we just have like 15 minutes each to give you an update where we are, focus on five of those key initiatives. The online growth, direct admissions and dual enrollments, I've told you these are ones that already are moving and moving fast. Innovation is one that we will actually roll out in the next week. And then open education resources is for me one that's very close personally to my heart as well. I've explained that a little bit. Is one of the initiatives that we will do later on through our uh, uh, prioritization of the different strategies that we will follow. On the online growth agenda, um, you will see it ties into strategies one, two, seven, eight, and nine. One and eight is actually on enrollment management. Strategy two deals with the support for students. Seven is innovation. How can we actually innovate technology like artificial intelligence in the classroom? And nine is, of course, the strategy that deals with workforce and the workforce development. I also want to thank my two Chancellor colleagues, Ernay Wachter and Mark Moni, who is actually my co-sponsors, who spent a lot of their time on top of their jobs to attend many, many, many of these meetings. And also want to thank Glenda Lee Rodriguez, as well as John Coker, who now retired. I don't think that's why he retired uh, from Oshkosh, the provost, who actually led a work group within six months to compile a report, a comprehensive report that I thought was impossible to do. But under the leadership of President Rafkin, they said, I want to see this, can you get it done? And we got it done. The goal of this report that we actually did submit, and here is just a copy just to show you, this is the report that we have submitted. We really want to expand the online space in Wisconsin for just the traditional students, but also beyond the traditional students and also beyond Wisconsin. Because we have seen just statistically, one statistic here is the undergraduate student number that participate in some form in online education in our state. We are uh, the lowest from our Midwest uh, uh, states. We're at 49%. The average in Midwest is 60%. It just shows you this is an area that we can truly grow. And we troubled it during COVID, right? The online space. But that's an area where we felt if we are strategic and we invest our resources well, we can truly be strong in the online space. And secondly, the, the report also makes strong recommendation about how can we actually refunction, retool, rethink about extended campus and their role to support the online space. They do really good work, but that was also part of the transition team to say, how can we really reevaluate the role of extended campus? We have done a number of action items. We have presented this report to, to President Rothman. He accepted that. We have implemented, uh, started the implementation team. That's, they already started their weekly meetings. We have formed a, a Wisconsin Online Advisory Council, which was part of the recommendation. I want to thank also Provost John Chenovic from Whitewater, who cannot be here today. He's leading that advisory council. And we are moving very fast to develop uh, online portal, we will actually integrate all the online programs in a space that makes sense to the students as a marketing tool. So those are the things that has been done. What we are looking forward to is, of course, to populate now the online portal, to have that done early in the fall semester, then that's done. We also start just now started with benchmarking to really look what are the best practices around the nation for a unit like extended campus and what can we learn from it and how can we actually apply and implement it to really change extended campus into the support unit as was envisioned in the document. 
So that in a nutshell is where we are with the online growth. On the innovation, that ties into strategies seven and nine. Seven is the innovation and nine deals with workforce development and how we interact with the workforce. The goal is clear, it says there, is to cultivate, uh, 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 to foster a culture of innovation and to uh, advance uh, human knowledge and economic prosperity. You can read that in the uh, strategic plan. What have we done? We have convened a leadership group. I had a number of meetings with a number of chancellors and provosts and other people around, you know, who just innovative and say, give us ideas. How can we utilize what we want to do to be more and to create a culture of innovation in our system? We have done that. And based on that input, we have then developed a grant proposal model. And we actually called it the UW System Innovation Grant. And it's worth a million dollars per year for at least the next five years. We will encourage innovative ideas that we just said. We're going to do this. And that we run this also by the chancellors. We ask also for input from them and feedback and say, can we now move forward with this? So what we are now looking forward to is to actually finalize this grant proposal model and actually it will be finalized this coming week we will then send it out to the chancellors and then to actually facilitate proposals during the fall semester so that people can start doing this four comments here the one is we want to be truly innovative there's no real boundaries in what campuses can do secondly we really would prioritize collaboration amongst campuses but also with industry profit and non-profit thirdly it's a five-year cycle and fifthly, we will, the plan is actually to fund three proposals initially and say there are three proposals that really looks creative, innovative, you will get the funding for it. And the three proposals will be funded for two years. And then the third, fourth and fifth year, we will pick a big idea winner to be funded for a three more year period. And that will be then a cycle of five years. So hopefully that will be a very successful idea to allow you fail, but also to be creative in how we collaborate with innovation then on direct admissions strategies one and eight direct admissions some of you might know i want to thank uh, weatherly carl weatherly here region weatherly who did it bring us back to us and say i want to know what this is i asked that to the system move ahead it just simply means you 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 you, you sidestep the typical admissions process you are much more proactive you auto automatically admit students to college based on a data match between schools K to 12 and post-secondary institutions. That's in a nutshell what we meant by direct admissions. Well, I have also two executive sponsors, Erin Grisham and uh, Karina Diaz-Zuza from System. Karina is the vice chancellor for uh, students affairs at Oshkosh. We have done a lot of work. And if you look at the goal, I'm not gonna read the goal to you, but I'm just gonna tell you about the goal. We want to reach out, if we're successful with direct admissions, we really want to reach first generation students, students that are economically disadvantaged, that just don't know how to apply and suddenly you get this at, uh, invitation, you are admitted. We want to, with, if we're successful, we want to recruit more in-state students from Wisconsin because we've seen how we lost market share there. We also want to simplify the whole process if we're successful. And also we want to use this strategy to complement other initiatives such as financial aid and tuition promise programs. We have a report done, the report was accepted, we move forward, we have now an implementation team, and we envision that we will have three phases. We already started pilots, Green Bay and some of the other campuses we heard this morning, Eau Claire, I think Oshkosh, um, Milwaukee at UWM already moved into exploring what can we do with direct admissions. We are already in touch with the technical colleges to say, well, you know what, once they graduate, admit them. So that's kind of the second phase and the third phase of direct admissions, uh, direct admissions will be to look at the pilot where you can really work. And I want to also thank uh, Regent Underly here for really, we actually have people from DPI on the task force to help us with the data set so we can have actually districts of schools where we can actually start a pilot for the whole system. We want to have that done and implemented by the fall of 2024. So that's moving very fast, very rapidly. We actually look at the Minnesota model and it looks really good. That's the model we really would like to move forward on. On dual enrollments, um, I must say I was, uh, I think the word that I tried to use is, is flemixed. Is it confused? Did I say that the right way? <laughs> when I studied that initially, I did not get a good handle on what and how does it work in this state? I know dual enrollments. I know from Milwaukee where I was at UWM. But boy, if you really start to understand the difference between the technical colleges, how does it work, the legislation, it is really, really confusing. 
and it's not easy to unpack. The direct admissions look much easier than this one. So dual enrollments is another strategy, strategy one, two, and eight. Our goal is really to get more students in, to make it simpler, to really make sure that students <coughs> actually can graduate through our system and to give them that advantage should they want to join in dual enrollments. We have a task force, the task force has been formed. I want to make a comment about the task force membership. We have again DPI involved, heavily involved with us. We have members from campuses, faculty members in particular, because there are some quality questions here access questions so we have a number of faculty serving on this task force and we will work and finalize a recommendation to president rothman in september of this year and say hopefully we can be much more streamlined and successful and work with the legislator as it is needed as it relates to dual enrollments and my last one is open education resources oer um, i don't know if you know what op open education resources mean uh, the definition is simply we, uh, where learning, teaching, and resource materials are in any format or any medium, digital, book, whatever, that reside in the public domain. That's a key word. It's in the public domain. So you don't pay copyright. You don't pay for it. So it's affordable or what we prefer, it's actually free. And that I can tell you, I know when I was at UWM since 20. 16 till 2021 we saved the students around 3.5 million dollars just on study materials because the director of the library and the teaching and learning center director got together with the faculty and the students to develop a plan so that we can actually in the curriculum build in resources that are in the public domain to support just the cost of textbooks. That's why it's so personal that I do think if we're successful with open education resources, we can maximize affordability, access, and successful graduation of students, no doubt in my mind. Therefore, it's no, um, uh, uh, seek not secret, it's no um, surprise that we actually use the librarians and the teaching and learning centers to lead this effort. And we got them all together about a month ago on the 23rd of May. And we said, you need to think through with us on a strategic plan on really how to maximize the use of open education resources for our students system-wide so that we can really bring affordability through textbooks through this initiative. The other initiative that I just want to mention you, we also got accepted. We sent in an application to the AAC and you to join their online institute, the year-long institute. We got accepted for four of our campus. I think it's Green Bay, um, Milwaukee, uh, Stevens Point, Stout, uh, all got accepted and Stevens Point. And they are now part of a year-long virtual institute where we share best practices on how can we utilize open education resources to the benefit of those students. So those are in a nutshell, uh, five of the initiatives. That's exciting if we can really be successful in implementing these. Over to you, Sean. Thank you, Johannes. Great, and I'm gonna share progress on eight goals that fit under two broad strategy, strategies in the strategic plan, enhance the student experience and social mobility and foster civic engagement and serve the public good with particular emphasis on strategy five, right? Ensure our universities are financially and environmentally sustainable so that they are positioned to fulfill their strategic missions. So let's drill down a little bit. Um, as we look at enhance the student experience and social mobility, <clears throat> under strategy two, a goal of providing state-of-the-art facilities and digital platforms for student learning. We've made significant progress on this front. Under Stephen Hopper's leadership, um, we've done quite a few things, including the implementation of Okta, which is this next generation user authentic authentication tool, which improves the user's experience and simplifies access to all digital platforms. We actually have uh, the first few campuses already on board with all UW system campuses uh, going live before February of 2024. And then second item I completed, uh, we've heard a lot about this, the EAB Navigate platform. We just find a five, signed a five-year extension, which will push us out to 10 years of using EAB to improve our student success outcomes. We have great longitudinal data at this point. The campuses are very supportive of this initiative. And in fact, President Rothman agreed to contribute $5 million to the cost of that contract, which is about 40% of the total value are providing a lot of support for those institutions to move forward. Um, as we look ahead, uh, we do continue to leverage our existing continuous improvement processes to involve the digital learning environment. This is a space 
that is changing very quickly. Again, Stephen Hopper and his team, along with the academic affairs folks, are really making a lot of progress in how we best serve both students and faculty. And then finally, conducting some best practice assessments to improve the student experience with both digital and physical technology, right? It's not just uh, the faculty experience. Obviously, we want the students to feel supported in tools and assets that they can provide for their learning. On strategy three, again, under enhance the student experience and social mobility. Uh, our goal here is to coordinate with universities to enhance professional development that fosters career progression. One thing I can say, I think in my experience at Systems, we don't do a particularly good job of developing our own people. Um, this is, an, I, I think, something that is acknowledged very well in strategic plan. And in fact, I've been working very closely with Dan Chainer in improving how we do this. And we hired a training and development coordinator to pri prioritize professional development needs internally at UWSA and across the UW system. Now, we were able to reallocate existing resources to fund this position at the system level. So very excited about what this may mean for our staff moving mm -hmm. forward. And you know, if you were at the Business and Finance Committee meeting earlier today, we actually approved three additional training modules in the Workday implementation to help support career development in our HR capacity for all employees. And that includes a module for candidate engagement, a module for messaging candidates through text messages, and then finally some um, Cloud Connect for learning, so LinkedIn learning, for example. How do we leverage these tools that are out there to grow our employees? Uh, looking ahead, uh, one of the things we'd like to do is develop and launch a system-wide supervisor training to enhance development of our employees. Again, not something we do particularly well, um, and we need to grow our own, right? And we have the resources and ability to do that. So we will be launching this over the next year or so. And then finally, partnering with our campus constituencies and our shared services to survey common training opportunities that can be prioritized for system-wide implementation. What we're learning is that many campuses have different needs on the training front, but we can be a coordinator of those, <clears throat> those campus opportunities and then prioritize them for system-wide implementation through the Workday tool. Moving to foster civic engagement and serving the public good, uh, we've had a lot of conversation about this goal. How do we eliminate structural financial deficits at all of our UW campuses? Uh, we've been working on this really since Jay, uh, P President Rothman has come through the door. Um, and most recently, we held individual campus conversations uh, with campus leadership uh, regarding FY23 and FY24 budget projections. We had uh, financial data provided to us by the institutions outlining their structural deficits for this fiscal year that just ended and moving forward to FY24. You've seen some of those graphs and charts about what we're looking at moving forward. And then just uh, within the past month, uh, we did sign an engagement with Deloitte to help assist campuses in planning, uh, forecasting, benchmarking, um, revenue diversification, and other areas on a one-by-one -one level. Uh, so they'll be coming in and doing one campus at a time to get through all 13 UW institutions, uh, probably within the next nine to 10 months or so. In fact, I think Deloitte will be reaching out to some region um, members as well to get some input on how we can best proceed on that effort. And then as we all know, we, we brought forward a, a slate of uh, tuition differential increases uh, last March to support those high demand, high cost programs, uh, primarily in nursing, engineering, computer science, and business. We'll continue to look for opportunities uh, to grow tuition in areas where we do have those high cost, high demand programs. Looking forward, um, you know, it's really important that we do establish multi-year projections for campuses. Um, campuses have different glide paths, right, to getting into financial viability status. I would say some have, can do it in a year, several probably will take several years, but we need good data to support what that glide path may look like. And so we're working internally at System with my team, along with Deloitte, and looking at those projections and providing some benchmarking data what are those revenue diversification opportunities? And then finally, some detailed financial planning to help resolve structural deficits. I will also add, you know, there's a lot of promise in ATP. It seems like we talk about it all the time. It's gonna solve all of our problems. I look at you, Regent Atwell, he's shaking his head again. But I, I do think, you know, as we progress in our maturity in ATP, particularly on the budget planning and forecasting side, we're gonna have a lot more tools and visibility into our operations to help manage those deficits moving forward. Again, the plan in the strategic plan, the goal is by FY28. I'm hoping we can do that sooner. 
And then uh, we've talked a lot about this as well. It, it's time uh, that we look at our current GPR allocation for all the UW campuses. Um, this has been a long time coming. We've had three false starts at this effort over the last 12 years or so, but I think it's time. We don't have a dynamic tool that acknowledges lots of elements in how we allocate our GPR, but we wanna make it a goal to come up with some considerations uh, for region approval and the president's approval uh, before FY25, so within the next year. Let's see, okay. Moving to strategy five again, uh, implement shared services in cost-effective manner, preserving benefits for our universities. Obviously, you know, ATP and continued implementation of Workday is very key to establishing a modern platform and foundation to facilitate our shared services. We will continue to expand IT as a service, another uh, Stephen Hopper initiative to leverage the scale of system and the centralized management of IT. We have several campuses on board now and a goal of expanding that across the UW within the next year or so. And then we established a, a shared services pilot at Parkside. So we took a look at their HR operations, said, hey, what can we do for Parkside and what can we scale up for the balance of the UW system? It's been working well. I'm gonna use it to model some potential opportunities for the centralization and consolidation of those administrative functions. And a new one, as we look ahead, again, Stephen Hopper and his team, um, you know, how do we improve our uh, information security environment? So we want to establish a security operations center with some seed funding from UW system through a third party, uh, so we can have 24 seven monitoring at all UW campuses. We acknowledge this as a pretty key gap right now for our institutions, and we feel we have an, a solution here to help um, all the UW in the near term, uh, likely within the next three to four months. And then finally, inventory all our business processes to assess our most efficient strategy for service delivery, create a roadmap to enact recommendations prior to implementation of Workday. We really have this opportunity now as we run up to the Workday go live date of next July to really do this key survey and inventory of our processes to refine and streamline before we get ready uh, to go live in a year. Again, under strategy five is uh, applying the principles of environmental sustainability with respect to our built environment. I'm really proud of this one. I think regents will know that we had the students come uh, before this group and we're out at the board meeting in Stevens Point. This is something that means a lot to students. Uh, we've made a significant progress under Alex Rowe's leadership. Uh, we actually hired two project positions in sustainability over the course of Biennium to help develop the system vision and framework for the built environment. Um, and this is really great. I mean, we, I had them speak before the CBOs uh, at our retreat a couple of weeks ago, and they are just very exciting and energized to get to work. Um, in fact, we, uh, Liz Davies it was the first person that we hired and was quickly followed by Hadley Henderson uh, just a few weeks ago. And they're already off and running. In fact, they reported out to the board, uh, the Capital Planning Committee, and updated the Capital Planning Criteria in RPD 1915 to incorporate sustainability into our physical development principles. So two pretty big wins there right out of the gate, and we have a lot more to come. And as we look ahead, uh, we've talked a lot about virtual power purchase agreements. Uh, we are gonna engage with a consultant over the next year to determine the viability of that option for our institutions. And we're gonna continue to pursue opportunities that conserve energy, retrofit our built environment, outsource energy infrastructure, and mitigate our energy volatility. One thing I have seen, uh, and we've all seen, right, in the last couple of years, energy costs have spiked considerably. And we don't have great tools to mitigate um, those spikes right now. In fact, um, you know, we have a, a small reserve at system that we use to backfill for any energy volatility, and we've exhausted that pool two years in a row now, um, FY 22 and 23. So that is a big concern for us moving forward. Then, of course, we will assist in campus planning to develop the long-range sustainability plan with some measurable objectives. All of the campuses are doing work around sustainability. This is to help augment their existing resources and to improve upon what we can do uh, for the system. Uh, strategy five, uh, employees zero-based budgeting principles at UW system administration level. Jay talks to me a lot about this. <laughs> uh, and we've made a lot of progress. In fact, uh, we have reviewed all of our SE expense. We established criteria on how we allocate SE by FTE throughout all UWSA divisions for FY24. Uh, one thing we've done, we've centralized all of our IT purchasing. 
We've actually centralized our professional development funds as well. So this gives us opportunities to be more strategic and efficient in how we allocate those resources. But that's just step one. We have a lot more progress to make as it relates to zero-based budgeting at the system level. Um, you know, under the uh, recommendations of the transition report, we did consolidate administration and finance units under one vice president. We did downsize our project management function considerably. And we instituted a formal position review process for vacancies and new positions. And that's been very effective in controlling the, the ebb and flow of backfills and new hires. In fact, um, our salary savings number actually grew quite considerably when we had more control over that process. So that's gonna yield some more savings for us as well. As we look forward, we still have work to do on establishing a template for our future expenses. We want alignment with the strategic plan. I think we've done a very good job of holding back vacancies and repurposing for other areas in alignment with the plan, but we need more work to do there as well. And I think what COVID taught us too is, and we, we look at travel expenses um, and our overall spending on sponsorships and conferences and subscriptions and so forth. I was amazed at how much we saved over that two year period. Um, and a lot of folks have not really returned to that kind of pre-pandemic level of travel. So we've seen our travel budget come down considerably, and I've seen that across the UW as well. But similarly on the sponsorships and conferences side too, I think we have some opportunities in that area to, to achieve some savings. And then I think on strategy five again, you know, working with our universities to develop uh, sustainability plans for the two year campuses to ensure that they are financially viable. Of course, uh, we all know that we moved to in-person academic instruction, uh, transitioning uh, for that Richland County campus. Uh, Johannes Britz and his folks uh, convened a task force in the two-year campuses to address both the issues and opportunities that may be on the horizon. We did receive uh, proposals from the campuses and assessments um, on how, what we need to do going forward to maintain uh, the viability of those two-year institutions, or what alternative plans may be in the works going forward. Um, so looking ahead, we will evaluate the current tuition structure. So right now we do have um, two tiers of tuition. We have the four-year campus tuition, and then we have the two-year campus tuition. I think this is something we need to look at more closely moving forward and provide a recommendation uh, to this board uh, at the next, next April's meeting. Then I think we simply need to establish a financial model for evaluating the viability of those two-year campuses, right? What are those metrics? What are the tools in which we can do that? This includes the evaluation of our MOUs, the respective counties. So we do have a complex financial structures in place. You know, we have MOUs with every county that supports a two-year campus. And what is that financial relationship with them? And what do we need to look at, I think, moving forward to maintain the viability of those campuses? Uh, on strategy five, again, identify sound financial vehicles and revenue securing opportunities for the universities. This is another area I'm, I'm particularly excited about. Uh, we established a cash management program through Chuck Saunders and the UW Office of Trust Funds to invest in the capital markets. So we were earning, you know, five, six, seven, eight basis points on our cash. And well, the market hasn't been particularly great the last year, but I think the endeavor itself is going to prove to be very successful. We're investing for the long term, and I think we're very excited about what the possibilities may be for those uh, cash resources. Uh, we are going to actually expand that. Uh, right now, it's only the Madison campus. Uh, Milwaukee will be next, and then we're looking at pooling um, the balance of the UW institutions into a more perhaps intermediate term fund moving forward. We've also moved towards accelerating a deposit of our short term cash to take, take advantage of our money market rates. So right now we have seven days to kind of report our cash back up to uh, the state. Um, well, we're taking that seven day period and we're going to invest that cash and then send the money on the last day back up to DOA. And with the money market rates where they're at today, we're going to be able to achieve some considerable uh, earnings on that short term cash. So very positive development there as well. I think looking forward, we have a lot of exciting things on, on the horizon, exploring some P3 partnerships. Uh, Superior is active in one right now. Obviously, Madison has been very active on this, uh, on this front as well. Um, looking at program revenue bonding, we're not going to give up on securing that option for us, for the university going forward. And finally, exploring pathways for entrepreneurial real estate opportunities within the campus footprint. So some really exciting stuff, uh, I think, under this area. And that wraps it up to me, and I will pass it over to Jeff Barrett. Thank you, Sean. Um, I broke this down in a little bit of a hybrid way. We have the four pillars that were built that are built uh, the ground, the, the framework of our strategic plan. I'm going to spend a little time talking about specifics, 
specific actions on one, two, and four. But then I also want to talk about how some of our partnerships really feed into the strategic plan at all, overall and from many different ways. So first off, enhancing the student experience and social mobility. Um, strategies one, two, and three. Uh, I, what we've been able to accomplish here right off the bat, we were able to get the Wisconsin tuition um, promise funded in the governor's budget, but it was not approved by the legislature. As I point to later, we are going to continue to find alternative funds for this. We believe it's really important, especially with what's happening in Minnesota. We uh, ran a campaign uh, to increase the FAFSA completion, and we were actually increased it by about 2% last year. Progress being made on that and gives us some ideas for things we can do moving forward. Um, the Joint Finance Committee, and I didn't update the slide, the governor has signed a four and two. That is, as, uh, I think as Sean has pointed out, that's very close to what we asked for. I think the board asked for a four and four. So that's a really good progress. That is the largest um, salary increase or compensation increase, I think in 10 or 15 years at least. So that's good progress in that. Um, we've also been, to help support that, we've been running student testimonials and the value of UW educators throughout our social media here at board meetings. I think those have helped us build a good narrative for the great work being done on our campuses. Moving forward, we're still going to look to increase um, Pell grant funding, but also FAFSA simplification. It's the easier the FAFSA will be, the easier it will be for us to promote. And then finally, again, talking about um, continuing to secure funding for the tuition promise. We're university relations, so we had to have pictures. I wanted to show you guys some examples of some of the stuff we did on social media with uh, um, for the FAFSA campaign. The, this is all run through the communications and public affairs team led by Jack Jablonski. This is stuff we do internally. We don't contract out for it. All those videos you see at the board meetings, we do that internally and it's great savings for us moving forward. More pictures. So this is the part I want to talk a little bit about how partnerships feed into the strategic plan in so many different ways. And obviously, as the university, um, the Office of University Relations, relationships are pretty important to us. So first off, UW Stout and UW System are both members of the Wisconsin Council on Manufacturing and Productivity. This is a group that receives federal funding to help small manufacturers become more productive and more efficient. Now, Stout's faculty is already very embedded in this group. They're working hard with them. We believe there are many, many opportunities for our faculty from the other universities to be a resource for this group. It's an opportunity for our faculty to engage in innovative, in innovative work. It's also an opportunity for us to bring our expertise to help the state. Uh, we're all, UW System was one of the founding partners of Titletown Tech, um, which is a, an adventure capital firm in Green Bay. We want to. We want to evolve our relationship there and make it more student focused. We know that getting our students those high impact practices out in a place like Titletown Tech where they get to meet entrepreneurs and learn how entrepreneurs work could be extremely valuable to them. And it's valuable to Titletown Tech as they try to grow the entrepreneurial infrastructure of this state. So we're looking to make that shift coming soon as well. Um, we are working on increasing our engagement with both Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce, as well as the Governor's Council on Workforce Investment, chaired by Regent Tyler to my right. Um, WMC, for the first time that I've been here, actually kind of went to bat for system, not only on the capital side, but on the operational side. That's a really important relationship, and I think real progress has been made there. If you want to get more resources for our universities, if you want to be more aligned with the employers, it's throughout our strategic plan, that group is really critical. And uh, I think we've been able to build a stronger relationship with them and we've got some work to do as well. And in the Council on Workforce Investment, um, it's the governor's group that is supposed to be out there talking about what kind of investments our workforce needs. We can, we obviously, as Jay said earlier, we are one of the great workforce producers in the state. We have to play a bigger role in the committee. And I've talked a little bit to Mark about that, but I've got some ideas for how we can do that moving forward. Talk a little bit about WISIS. We've been able to have a new agreement with WISIS in place that I think can actually help us maximize the work they do on behalf of the UW system. It also helps us evolve. Is their, if their role is going to evolve and change in how they serve the campuses, we want to make sure that we understand how that's working here at system, but also at the campuses. And again, it's all about a culture of innovation. WISIS is really all about that. And we want to make sure they've got the tools to do it and that we also are getting what we expect from the organization, which I really believe we are. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about BioForward. They're an interesting group. They're a, a collaborative of groups. Oops, hold on. Um, a collaborative of groups from around the state that work in the biotech industry, and they cover. I think I was adding it up four or five different strat strategies in the work they do for us. Number one, they've been here at the board meeting testifying about the value of UW System. They've recorded videos. We've filled social media up talking about how great the UW System is, and they've been an advocate in the Capitol. They've actually gone out and advocated for our operating budget. 
It's a great group. But we're also, in part because of the work we did on the advocacy side, they've become a great partner in our efforts to secure a $65 million federal grant for the state that would designate us as a tech hub. And they're a huge part of that. And the relationship we're building with them and the rest of the tech industry and the biotech industry is going to be beneficial up and down the strategic plan. And it's the kind of relationships we have to focus on and grow more and more because that's really where we're going to make progress, I think, moving forward with the legislature and the public in general. So next up, fostering, oh, I don't remember I'm running this, foster civic engagement and serve the public good again, strategy four. So far we've been able to do, this is a big topic for us obviously, this is a big priority for Jay, but I think it's a big priority for many of us here. Uh, we've conducted the Student Freedom of Expression First Amendment Survey. It's a controversial survey, but it has provided us with some data and I think some legitimacy in the space when we talk about it. We've had panels on civil dialogue and freedom of expression, including Speaker Voss, Senator Larson, Senator Royce, Representative Emerson, Representative Murphy, experts in the field. These have been well received and we're definitely going to do more of them moving forward. As Jay pointed out earlier, his Just Coffee events at various universities, again, it's us engaging directly where students are. I think that's an offshoot, really, of the survey and our work to understand where our students are. We've created the Wisconsin Institute for, Civic, uh, for Citizenship and Civil Dialogue, WICKED. Great name, I know, you love it. Um, WICKED's going to, we're going to hire an executive director at some point to help us work in this space to really support the campus's work, not replace their work, but support it and hopefully find some resources to help us move that forward. And finally, on that, um, sponsor, sponsor the Wisconsin Civics Games this year for the first time to encourage citizenship among middle and high school students. We want to reward that work and we want to be a part of that work so students see us as part of that conversation. Now, moving forward, we need to do more with K-12 to promote an understanding of free speech. One of that's going to happen through WICKED and our relationship with the Civic Games. And we need to assess what resources our universities need to promote civil dialogue and freedom of expression. It's not, these programs aren't free. There's funding out there, but we've got to have a better understanding of what our needs are moving forward. So fostering civic engagement and serving the public good, um, strategies one and five. This is our tribal nation cons consultation process. It began last September. We agreed to a collaborative work plan in April of 2023. Our work plan is really focused on student success and increasing access, including a potential tuition waiver. I know a number of our universities have discussed that. Looking forward, we just need to continue to work this plan and come up with some deliverables. Um, Dr. Sasanasa Jennings, who is our tribal liaison, has led this effort and will continue to work closely with the universities and with uh, the tribes as we find solutions and find some interesting actions we can take to support their work. Advancing economic prosperity. So our government relations team led by Deej Lundgren met with the legislative candidates at every open seat last fall. We've done this the last couple times and it allows us to at least get the UW system's perspective in there, in, in before them, before they come to the Capitol. Um, we provide a, bu a budget briefing, but most of the time we provide an overview of what UW system is because most of the candidates don't really know. Um, as you know, we've got the Minnesota tuition reciprocity bill has actually been introduced this year. It is AB 140, SB 161. It's authored by Representative Zimmerman and Senator Staffschult. It has broad bipartisan support on the co-sponsorship list, and it's had a hearing in the assembly. We are well far ahead of where we were on this bill two years ago. And the sooner you get those steps taken, the better chances you have to actually get the bill passed. So we're very excited about that. Another exciting move we've made is the Director for Economic and Employer Engagement position. We've hired Dr. Idella Camden, who comes to us from IBE, a group I'm going to talk to a little bit later. She is worked in the entrepreneurial space and the tech transfer space for years. She brings a great level of experience to us, and I think she will help us really move forward with how we engage with our economic and our employer partners. A really exciting piece that we've just concluded in, in, is the partnering with CASE to host an annual University Foundation Development Seminar. I'm going to have a little bit more on that in a second, but that was a really good first step, and I think a lot of great ideas coming from that group. And as I touched on earlier, one of the great things about Idella is she's a board member of BioForward in her old role, and she will now be writing the grant for this federal this federal $65 million grant, working very close with Exact Science, with WDC. They asked her to do it. And so we actually hired her two weeks faster than we were going to hire her because we need to start working on the grant. And that's a role we've never played before. And I think it's great that system is in the middle of that and then is in the mix. Now, moving forward, one of Idella's first jobs is going to be identifying the top employers and top industries that we need that system wide relationship with, but also 
drilling down with each of the universities to make sure we know what you guys have, we know what the campuses need and how we can help. And finally, on the um, with the development officers, we really want to have an ongoing relationship and be a, more support for them moving forward. So um, we've got we've got a project where we're going to have a resource page that will be driven by them by the things they need, and then we're going to start convening them once or twice a year as um, university relations. I, it, this this was right in the middle of the budget, and everybody was so happy. I didn't really want to leave. Um, it was just a lot of great energy in the room. So we took a picture. That's how great the event was. People were very excited. They're happy that system seems to want to help and, and not get in the way. So we're, we're excited about this. I think about eight or nine campuses were, were, were there um, and a lot of excitement moving forward. Have to give a big shout out to Kim Way from Eau Claire and Willie Jude from Parkside. They kind of served as our unofficial co-chairs. They informed this event and I think uh, helped us kick off a really good start. Back to economic, advancing economic prosperity. Um, these are a couple of very, I'm going to very, they're very seemingly small projects, but I think this is an opportunity for growth for us moving forward. And they're run through the IBE, which I'll talk about more in a second. The Capital Access Clinic at UW-Eau Claire has six students and one faculty supervisor conducting pro forma construction and consulting to prepare clients for accessing capital. Similar at Oshkosh, we have a digital marketing clinic where students studying marketing work with the faculty and they provide assessments for small businesses. Small businesses starting off can't hire a marketing director to set up their website to talk about how to market their product. We're actually giving students this real world experience, but we're also providing a great resource to these businesses. We can do more of these. And I think these are the two pilots. They've got some federal funding behind them. Um, IBE and the, and the folks in that unit have got a lot of ideas for expanding these, and they don't have to be regional. They may be run out of UW Oshkosh, but we might have students from all over the state participating. So that's an exciting development that is really at the ground floor of economic development. Also on this topic, we want to work with the career, the career center directors to create a more easily accessible port, uh, portal at UW Systems website. They've been great to work with so far. We've made a lot of progress in trying to figure out what that portal needs. And as we redo our website, um, and some of the things Johannes talked about, we can actually have a much more dynamic web presence that supports the campuses even better. Uh, also, the USDA Farm Services um, Food Finance Institute has been selected to conduct a project aimed at keeping disadvantaged farm landowners on their land and help other disadvantaged farmers become landowners. This is a federally funded program that is in rural Wisconsin that is run through the UW system. They're a unit, the, the Food Finance Institute is part of UW system. This is an opportunity for us to get into a place that we have not spent a lot of time in the past. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to, to make some noise in this space. And finally, moving forward again on that rural side, WDC um, is considering a $5 million contract, contract application submitted by um, IBE. And this project would, in funding for consulting and training scholarships for 2,400 rural <laughs> based businesses and 6,800 eligible small businesses. This would bring people into our campuses and into the programs offered by UW System through the IBE. And I think that's exciting for us as we try to build more partnerships. And the IBE just very quickly to just, to, this is not a group that's talked about a lot here, but I think they do some really great work. And I think they can be a big part of advancing the strategic plan. The units within are the Small Business Development Center, the, 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 the Food Finance Institute, the Center for Technology Commercialization, and the Business Development Resource Center. They all are the, work very closely with WDC and statewide economic groups to support real ground level economic development, but they also work with the Rockwells of the world. So they're, I think, a critical tool in helping us uh, serve the state and completing our plan. So with that, I guess we're at the any questions stage. Right, thank you gentlemen for that very informative presentation. I'd like to ask my Regent colleagues if there are questions or comments. I have a question for you. Uh, could one or two of you describe the ways that you have engaged with uh, shared governance on the implementation of the plan um, or communicating with, with shared governance? Uh, Regent President, yeah, I could just say in terms of the online growth agenda, we shared the development phases uh, with the shared governance group when we met with them. We also had a faculty member as a member of the planning team and then the final report before we really finalized it was also sent out to all the campuses again um, for input so that i thought was a good example of how we engaged the campuses for share, through shared governance on input on the online plan i thank you uh, for that um, 
Vice President Brist, I'd, I'd just like to, you know, make a personal plea that we make sure that those folks are included so that they don't feel blindsided at the end when we've um, got a, a full plan to share with them. Yes, Regent Menendez. Thank you, President Walsh. I'd like to second that. I really think it's really, really important that we just don't prepare something and send it out and say, here it is, a couple of you got to look at it and said it was okay. I think I'd feel more comfortable if more people, anyone who needed that access and could comment on it, would be better for us as a system, as a team, collaborating. That's what we've been trying to push, and I'd like to see that guaranteed to have happened. All right. Anyone else? Yes, yes. I've got a question on dual enrollment. Um, I understand that, that we charge like half the going rate uh, for dual enrollment classes in the high school. Um, I know our technical colleges provide that dual enrollment at no charge. Um, and I, I understand fiscal stress is among, is on us, and, but I, I would encourage that we look in some way to find a path to get those uh, costs covered while in high school. I mean, that's a, it, 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 it feels foreign to me that you should be paying tuition when you're still in high school, even though you are potentially receiving university credit. So um, not sure I need a response, just a comment on an opinion. Thank you, Regent Nevin. I, I look at uh, Chancellor Levitt here, who's actually the co-sponsor also. I forgot to mention that with two of my provost colleagues. And I know Oshkosh has the largest contingency of, of uh, dual enrollment students. The funding model is a challenge uh, because there's a lot of cost involved as well. And there is a big difference between the technical colleges as well as the system. So that's what, I, and then even in the system, there are differences of how it is being applied and how it's being done. And that's what I mentioned, it's really complicated. So I just hope and the leadership of the team that we have uh, established will come with a report to address some of these issues. And I don't know, Chancellor Levitt, if you want to say something on that without putting you on the spot there. Yeah, thank you, Regent Tyler. A completely different experiences. Um, the UW, way, the way most of us do here in the UW, of course, we're actually providing the classes uh, where in the technical college system is done largely through transcription. So after the class has been taken, the, the tech college evaluates the work where we're actually providing instruction. So that's the big difference why we charge money and perhaps the tech college do, do not. Thank you, Regent Tyler. Other regents, Regent Atwell. Um, thank you very much. I really appreciate the the update and and the urgency with which uh, with which you guys are attacking the the uh, strategic plan, the implementation of it. It's one thing to have a plan; it's another to actually do it. Um, on the online, um, I, you know, I I remember several presidents ago. I think it was uh, uh, former President Cross kind of threw out a statistic about our online market share within the state. In other words, if you looked at total online uh, enrollment for, of, of students in Wisconsin, and I believe he threw out a number of 8%. I have no idea where he got that number, if it was even remotely accurate. But but it was shockingly small, given our, our, um, our market share of enrollment of, of on-campus students. So, um, and, 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 so I think it's really important the work that we're doing to try to uh, deal with the digital disruption, if you will, of our traditional model. Um, one of the big challenges across industries when they're dealing with digital disruption, we've seen it in many, many different industries, is uh, digital drives cost out and, 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 and can definitely cannibalize the rev traditional revenue sources that would cover traditional costs. So how are we going to deal with pricing in a digital environment? And, and, and Mark, to your point about why don't we take the cost to zero uh, as the tech schools do for dual enrollment, that's, you know, how, how do we deal with the, how do we deal positively with gaining digital market share while addressing the fear of even further disruption of our traditional structure. Does that make sense? 
Yet, if I understand it correctly, Regent, I think the, uh, the pricing structure for online education is more complex. There's not just one model that you use. It depends also whether it's a hybrid class, whether it's an uh, undergraduate class, whether it is a graduate class, whether it's people who do returning adults that come for a specific short section of classes. I do think, and maybe I don't answer the question from an economic perspective, so I'll ask Sean to elaborate more on that, but I do think you let the market also play in that we have more flexibility on pricing than we have with a set tuition for students on a campus specifically. Mm -hmm. So I do think we have more flexibility to generate income in a way that you cannot really do with the on-site classes. Sean, I don't know if you want to yeah. add a little bit to that. If it was a really good answer that he cannot add. Well, maybe I didn't say it like, but it, it, maybe I didn't phrase the comment slash question clearly enough. It, if we, if if digital, if we're selling a digital product that provides the credential people are looking for at a much lower price than our on-campus delivery, how do we deal with the fear or the reality of disrupting our own revenue streams? This is, this is not just a higher ed problem. It's not just a UW problem. It's a, every industry that's dealing with this problem. And, and maybe, Regent well, I could just share a couple thoughts for, for whatever they're worth. Um, either we're going to disrupt ourselves or somebody else is going to disrupt us. So I think we have to be in a position to say that this is where at least a portion of the educational sector is going. How do we best position ourselves to continue to serve the students so they're not you know, whatever online institution you want to talk about are coming in and, and addressing, uh, you know, serving students in our state. And I think we can use the value of uh, a UW, regardless of the university, that brand means something, particularly in the state, to be able to try to maintain as much from a pricing perspective as we can, because you don't want to do, you don't want to have the race at the bottom either. We can get to zero real fast, and that's not going to allow us to continue to provide the quality of education that our students deserve and the state deserves. So I think we've got to adjust to that as we go forward. While at the same time, uh, I think being open and honest with prospective students, particularly the traditional student going through the experience, that in-person experience is pretty important. Um, and I think. All the studies coming out of the pandemic, even in the work environment, where it's not quite as productive as we thought it might be, even though we're not having transition costs of getting to and from work, that that experience on campus, because at least in my one example of my, my own situation, that um, I learned more outside of the classroom sometimes than I did in, um, because you were challenged by your fellow students. You had to learn what, what it was like to live in a dorm, and you had to learn, you know, all sorts of things, some good, some bad, but, and I think we have to, we have to find that balance. For the, as we try to address the 700,000 people in the state who have some college credit that didn't finish, that's going to be online. A lot of the graduate programs are going to be online, and we simply have to get there. As it related to the market share before, and I think I, I give Johannes and his team a lot of credit. Um, and the chancellors that have been involved in the entire team that's been on, we had extended campus, which was really an online university, separate from our other 13 universities. And that whole thing is pivoting so that we have that extended campus becomes a support for our universities, the 13 that are putting together online programming, so that we can help support what they, what they need to do. Because I think that juxtaposition in some sense, we could have been seen like we were competing against ourselves, and that probably, well, no, that wasn't the right answer, that we want to be able to make that shift and really be that support function for the university developing the program. And I'm excited about the online portal, because right now, if you went on and you said, what, what do UW universities offer on the online side? Hard to find. And we did that exercise. Yes. A couple of meetings or whatever a year ago. Yes. And that, so that eight percent tells a story. We're already being disrupted. That's why we have to have an online strategy. But can it be done in a way that it actually feeds into our on-campus enrollment? And it, because it is a different product, um, I, right? I, I, it is a different product, but I think it's also it's not an either-or situation. In a lot of cases, it's going to be a hybrid situation where some's going to be in person, some's going to be on, some will be online. But you're absolutely right. I mean, in in we have to, we're going to have to figure out a pricing model that works to be able to provide a quality product 
and quality instruction while at the same time understanding that our competitors will kind of kind of keep kind of coming below us because if you can edu educate 100,000 students, there's enormous leverage that you can create in terms of, of how you do that. How do we do that on a broader basis? But I think we first have to, to walk before we run. And when, when, when Johannes was talking about what our online percentage is vis-a-vis -vis all the Midwestern states, we've got enormous opportunity there. And I think it's gonna be the value of that UW University degree that will allow us hopefully to maintain a fair level of pricing so that we can continue to offer a great product. The other thing I just want to note on the on the on the dual enrollment piece, just so so it was clear, our ability to, as as Chancellor Levitt indicated, our ability to offer that on a cost-free basis, those are students who are coming to us or who we are instructing. We have instructors doing it. What the tech colleges are doing, and I'm not making a value judgment, I'm just saying what they're doing is that they're working with high school teachers, and the high school teachers are teaching the curriculum, and then through the transcription process, uh, the, the, the tech college is, is awarding credit for the experience in the high school. Very different experiences. And those credits mind. can be transferred into our system? comment on the Please. on the dual enrollment piece too it's also set up differently in state statutes so there's two statutes one for the tech college one for the uw the tech college one it's 100 percent paid for by the high school the uw statute it's only a portion is paid for by the high school and then the other part is paid by the higher ed aid board and it's a cost situation too it costs a lot more for the high schools to be able to do it um, because of the cost of the credits and then as President Rothman indicated as well, the transferring is gonna be different because if you have somebody who's teaching the class, some of the instructors are tech college instructors, but um, those courses may not transfer based on accreditation because of the credentials of the person teaching the class. Yeah, that's the challenge that they run into is if, if the teacher has a bachelor's degree and you wanna transfer that into a bachelor's program, it's not gonna transfer. So there's, uh, I mean, there's complexity in pricing. There's cr complexity in credentialing too. Uh, there are questions from Regents. Seeing none, thank you, gentlemen, and we'll look forward to the next update. Keep up the good work. I should note that this meeting would customarily be where we would consider the UW system's 23-24 annual operating budget for the fiscal year that began just last week. Given the timing of the overall state budget process this year, however, we will defer consideration of our operating budget to a later date. Earlier today, the Business and Finance Committee did get an update from Vice President Nelson on forecasts for fiscal year 2023 and a preliminary outline of what to expect in fiscal 24. The board will reconvene a special meeting sometime within the next month after the proposed annual operating budget is finalized. Thank you, everyone. That concludes our open session. Vice President Bogust, will you please read the motion to move into closed session? I move that the Board of Regents move into closed session to consider personnel evaluations of chancellors as permitted by section 19.85, parent one, parent C, the Wisconsin statutes. Is there a second? Thank you very much. Call the roll, please, ma'am. Regent President Walsh? Yes. Regent Vice President Bogust? Yes. Regent Adams? Regent Atwell? Yes. Regent Brinkus? Regent Cologne? Yes. Regent Jones? Yes. Regent Cruiser? Yes. Regent Many Deeds? Regent Miller? Yes. I'll work on Regent it. Peterson? A little more. Regent Prince? Yes. Thank you. So. Regent Rye? Yes. Regent Staten? Regent Tyler? Yes. Regent Underly? Yes. Regent Wax? Yes. And Regent Weatherly? Yes. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. We'll just wait for a moment till the room is clear.